Volume Two, Chapter Two of the Life and Amours of the Beautiful, Gay, and Dashing Kate Percival, the Belle of the Delaware. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life and Amours of Kate Percival, written by herself. Volume Two, Chapter Two. Amy Denmead's History. I was born in Philadelphia. My father was a large and successful merchant, doing business there. We lived in a large house in the upper part of Chestnut Street, and my father's wealth procured me every luxury that the heart could wish for. I never knew my mother, for she died when I was quite young. My sister was married to you, Herbert, when I was seventeen years of age. My ideas up to that time were very vague regarding the sexes, but I was soon destined to be fully enlightened. I felt very dull after my sister had gone away, and my father proposed that I should write and ask my old schoolfellow, Florence Maltby, to come and stay on a visit with us. I cordially agreed to this proposition, for I loved Florence, and had not seen her for several years, although we kept up a constant correspondence. Florence accepted my invitation, and on the day agreed upon she took up her abode with us. Miss Maltby was a beautiful girl, about twenty years of age. Her hair and eyes were black. In fact, she was a decided brunette. She was fiery, impulsive, and amorous. We had a thousand things to converse about, and in a few hours all our old friendship was re knit, and we became more intimate than ever. Of course, we slept together. For two or three nights, nothing occurred of special moment. I noticed, however, that Florence would kiss me with a great deal of warmth, and press me tenderly in her arms when we were in bed together but I thought nothing of it. One night, about a week after she had been an inmate of our house, when we retired to our chamber, instead of undressing as usual, Florence seated herself on the side of the bed and watched me in the process of disrobing. I had unhooked the front of my dress, and it had fallen on my shoulders, and my chemise, being open in the front, allowed my two breasts to be seen. Nay, even a portion of the white plain below was visible. Florence no sooner saw this than her eyes brightened, and she ran up to me and began to mould my boobies. Although this action somewhat surprised me, I made no resistance, and to tell the truth, the contact of her soft hands on my breasts was very agreeable. "'What delicious breasts you have!' said Florence. "'How well formed they are, and yet how large! See how stiff the rosy nipples stand out from this field of snow!' Oh, how I would love to kiss and press them. And she buried her head between the two semi-globes. And then your belly, how soft and white it is. She continued, passing her hand over it. How happy will the man be who presses that belly to his own. Oh, fie, Florence, you should not talk in that manner, I replied, my face flushing with the fire kindled in me by her lascivious touchings. But you exaggerate my beauties. It is true my breasts are a little larger than yours, but they are not one bit more handsome, more firm, nor more elastic. Come, dear, let us compare them, for I do not see why I should not be gratified as well as yourself. I now unhooked Florence's dress and pulled it down to her waist. Her two semi-globes were completely exposed. They were beautifully formed, firm, elastic, and standing boldly out from her chest. I pressed and caressed them, sucking the rosy nipples which stood out stiff with desire. <laughs> you naughty girl, said Florence. <laughs> you will devour me. Your kisses send a fire through my veins and these delicious globes, too. Could it be possible to see prettier boobies than these, I interrupted. Just see how stiff the nipples are. And then you talk of my belly. Look at yours. How deliciously smooth, how beautifully white. Come, darling said Florence. Let us rub breasts together. I'm sure it will give us mutual delight. I will do anything you wish, Florence, for I feel a strange fire burning in me. Come, love, come. We pulled down our clothes as low as possible, so as to leave us a clear field. We then brought our chests together in such a way that our breasts rubbed against each other. To show how amorous we were, I need only say that this strange action gave us great delight. Is it not exquisite? 
said Florence. The sensations of your breast against mine fires my whole blood. I experience the same feelings, I returned. Oh, it is charming. Amy, said Florence, after a few minutes' repose, do you know what I would like to do? No. What? I should like to explore your more secret beauties. With all my heart, I replied, if you will allow me the same privilege. Willingly. I should love it, returned Florence. Come then, darling, I exclaimed. I am ready. Do with me as you like. <laughs> Dear girl, how good you are, returned Florence. Lie down with your belly on the bed, that I may admire and manipulate your beauties. That's right, darling. I threw myself on my face on the bed. Florence came behind me and, lifting up my petticoats, exposed my bottom to her gaze. Of course, she saw also the pouting lips of my bayou at the bottom of the fleshy cushions, faintly overshadowed with hair. She moved my thighs slightly apart, by which movements the lips of my sheath were slightly separated, revealing a line of coral between them. Florence absolutely threw herself on my bottom and devoured it with the most lascivious and ardent kisses. "'Does that position suit you, dear Florence?' said I, with my face buried in the bed. Hmm, "'It is charming and delicious,' said Florence, moulding and pressing my buttocks. "'Great heavens! Amy, how the sight of your beauties fires me! What magnificent buttocks! How white and firm! How well developed! and again she bent down and smothered them with kisses. "'I should never be tired kissing your lovely bottom,' she continued. "'And the edges of that dear little cleft I see between your thighs. How inviting it looks! How beautiful it is, shaded with silky down! Oh, I must! I must!' And she put her finger between the lips of my sheath and titillated my vagina. "'How charming! How delicious!' she repeated. Amy, I am in a blaze. My slit is on fire. How deliciously tight your vagina clasped my finger, and what a delightful warmth is there. There! Now I have your clitoris. How stiff it is! Tearest Florence, I exclaimed, wiggling my buttocks, for the in-and-out motion of her finger was more than I could bear. Your touchings and titillations are bringing on a crisis. Stay the motion of your finger, or I shall come. There! There! There it is. Oh, I die. I die. During this last speech of mine, I moved my buttocks up and down, imitating the conjugal act, Florence all the time continuing her manipulations until the crisis came and I fell motionless on my belly. Come, Amy, said Florence, withdrawing her dripping finger from my sheath. For heaven's sake, give me relief or I die. I rose from my recumbent posture and seizing Florence by the waist, pushed her on the bed. She fell on her back. I threw her petticoats over her head. This action revealed all the lower portion of Florence's body, and a beautiful sight it was. Two magnificently developed thighs led up to a charming grotto covered with black hair, between the pouting lips of which could be seen her clitoris. Stiff with intense desire, I admired for a moment Florence's beauties, and then commenced my manipulations. First of all, I stroked her belly, implanting kiss after kiss upon it. I then played with the hair covering her mons venerous, twisting my finger in and out of it. I then divided the lips of her sheath and titillated her highly excited clitoris. Great heavens, Florence, I exclaimed, what a beautiful bayou yours is, what delicious pouting lips, what a forest of black hair, and then your clitoris. How finely developed! Let me kiss it. Let me suck it. I now stooped down and inserted my tongue between the lips of Florence's ruby passage and titillated her clitoris with the tip of it. Great God, how delicious! I exclaimed. I feel ready to come again. I do indeed, darling. Amy, darling, keep on, keep on, said Florence, almost crazy with delight. Pass one hand behind and press my buttocks. I did as she desired, and advanced one finger in the narrow canal adjacent to the legitimate road, and kept time with my tongue and finger. There, that's it, she continued. I am coming. Oh, now, now, there, there, there. She opened her thighs to the widest extent, and lifted her legs high in the air. 
a convulsive shudder ran through her frame, and she discharged profusely, appearing to be perfectly annihilated by the deliciousness of her sensations. I threw myself by her side on the bed. After a long pause, we both rose and kissed each other tenderly. Such was my first initiation in the sports of Venus. Florence remained with us some months, and scarcely a day passed that we did not enjoy the pleasures of the gods. When she left us, I was for a time disconsolate, but soon after I received an invitation to visit Herbert and my sister. He has left it to me, dear Kate, to give the history of my first amour with him. I shall do so, freely speaking, as if he were not present. I was received with the utmost kindness by my brother-in-law, and truth compels me to state, rogue that he is, that he has always treated me with the most unvarying affection. At the time of my visit, my sister was very sick, and I really pitied poor Herbert, that he was debarred from those sexual enjoyments of which I felt assured he was so fond. But the thought of taking her place never for a moment entered my mind. Herbert was very polite to me, and time passed very agreeably. One day I stumbled in an obscure corner of the library on some amorous books. I secured them and conveyed them to my chamber. I then examined them and found that they contained pictures of a very lascivious character. In fact, men and women, as naked as they were born, were performing the sexual act. I read them with avidity, and they soon made me adept in sexual knowledge. One evening, when Herbert had gone to Philadelphia, and my sister was confined to her chamber by sickness, I entered the drawing-room with one of those prizes in my hand, determined to enjoy it all myself. I was in a state of delicious languor, and, throwing myself carelessly on the sofa, began to read my book. I wore a low-necked dress, and the weather being warm, I had unfastened two or three of the top loops thus leaving a considerable portion of my breasts exposed. My dress, too, was disarranged at my feet, revealing a considerable portion of my limbs. As I read, my cheeks became flushed, my bosom heaved, and I was altogether in a state, propitious for an attack. I was suddenly startled by the sound of a voice at my elbow. "'What is the name of that book which seems to engross so much of your attention?' said the voice. I raised my eyes, and who should I see but Herbert himself, gazing on me with heightened color and burning eyes. It is too bad, Herbert, I replied, raising from my seat, revealing by this moment a considerable portion of my legs. Nay, I believe he even caught a glimpse of my thighs. You ought not to come so stealthily into the room. My dear girl, you are wrong, replied Herbert. I did not come here stealthily but it was your preoccupation which prevented you from hearing me enter. But you have not yet replied to my question. What book are you reading? Oh, it is a stupid work I found in the library. I have only just glanced at it, and do not find it worth reading. Will you allow me to judge for myself, my charming sister-in-law? He replied, taking a seat by my side. No, Herbert, I will not allow it. I returned, pressing the book to my bosom. I insist he cried, endeavouring to snatch the work from my hands. In the struggle his hand came in contact with my bosom, and he even touched the strawberry nipples surmounting the semi-globes. At last he conquered and obtained possession of the book. I looked imploringly at him, but he opened it deliberately and read the title. It was The Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure. So, so, Amy, said he, this is the subject of your studies, is it? I assure you I have not read a page of it. It appears to me foolish and uninteresting, and I was just about to return it to the library when you entered. He knew that I did not tell the truth, for I blushed and cast my eyes down on the ground. He no longer hesitated, but throwing his arms around me, pressed his lips to mine and kissed me ardently. I was astonished and confounded and endeavoured to escape him but he held me tight, and pressed his breast to mine. Herbert, Herbert, this is wrong. Let me go, I beg of you. He replied by pressing another kiss on my lips. It was in vain I struggled. He appeared to be endowed with the strength of Hercules. Do have done, I murmured between each embrace, 
someone might come my love there is no cause for fear there is no one in the house but you and i your sister is confined to her chamber by sickness and i have given positive orders that i am not at home to any one we are absolutely alone i could not disguise the pleasure that this news gave me for my whole body became agitated with the warmth of his embraces and my bosom palpitated against his i even dared to return his caresses and reimbursed with interest the kisses he gave me amy i love and adore you said he herbert i love you i love you was the only reply that i could make again he pressed his lips to mine and sucked in my breath he even inserted the end of his tongue in my mouth and he met mine which was as ardent as his own i believe i should have died if nature had not given me relief at that moment i believe the same thing happened to him for he threw himself upon me and two or three convulsive shudders ran through his system he then became calmer and reclined negligently in my arms my beloved this is true happiness said he oh that we could remain thus for ever and that we might never part again after a few moments repose he rose up and leaning over me seized one of my hands and felt my boobies with his unoccupied hand the contact renewed the fire in his body and his eyes reassumed their brilliance when i felt his hand descend upon my breast i shivered and made a pretence of snatching it away but it was in vain he cautiously unhooked my dress i no longer restrained him my frock fell off my shoulders and my naked bust was entirely exposed to his view he passed from one to the other of my ivory globes as he called them and moulded them with his hands playing with the nipples and applying his lips to them so that he almost sucked my life away but he was not yet satisfied he knelt down before me and placing his head between my boobies began to play with my feet i made but little resistance and he began to raise my petticoats he touched my legs he reached my knees and at last his hand came in contact with my fleshy thighs he rested here a moment and excited me by kisses i trembled in his grasp like a leaf my desires overcame me and i was completely in his power he then became more bold and his agitated hand ascended the marble columns which would lead us to the centre of love at last he reached my bayou and ran his fingers in the down covering that mossy spot he even forced one more bold than the rest between the lips and gently rubbed my clitoris it was too much for me i opened my thighs to the widest capacity and absolutely cried with pleasure he then raised his head from my palpitating bosom and applied his lips where he had just put his hand he kissed my mons venerous a thousand times and inserted his tongue between the folding lips he again sought out my clitoris and played with it at will but this could not continue long i was absolutely drunk with delirious joy oh what pleasure i cried do what you will with me my dear herbert his only reply was to divest himself of his clothes he then performed the same office for me and we were both naked as we were born he turned me round and round he patted my buttocks and caressed my body all over my hands too were not idle i seized his magnificent instrument and gently rubbed it and tickled his purse we were both almost crazy he then reclined me on the back of the sofa and threw himself on the top of me i eagerly opened my thighs to receive him and guided his fiery dart to the entrance of my con he entered the lips and met a little resistance but was not to be conquered for raising my buttocks i gave a sudden heave upwards and his instrument was suddenly embedded in the sheath destined by nature to receive it then commenced the delicious movements the motion was delightful i looked around me and saw our naked bodies reflected in the mirrors i could see his instrument entering in and out of my coral sheath at last the consummation came oh herbert i cried i die i die closer closer oh 
Thus muttering, I closed my eyes, my eyelids trembled, and with a convulsive movement I threw my legs around his loins and pressed him so tightly that I almost took away his breath. All was over, for I felt the essence of love rush into my thirsty womb, while I at the same moment poured down my share of Venus's libations. My hold relaxed, and we both fell all our lengths on the couch. After remaining without motion a few minutes, he kissed me again, for he was not yet satisfied. He soon rekindled my desires. He rose from the couch, and raising me up, placed me on its edge, and again commenced his labor of love. With one hand he raised one of my arms in the air, in such a manner as to leave my bosom entirely at his discretion. He took one of the nipples in his mouth, and pressed me to him with his other hand. My thighs were widely separated, and he had no difficulty in entering my vagina. He slightly bent his knees, and was soon buried in my grotto. How delicious was the sensation of his lovely engine rubbing against the sides of my vagina! I assisted him by every means in my power, and in a short time we were again inundated with our mutual emission. Such, my dear Kate, was the manner in which I first became carnally acquainted with Herbert. How many times we have enjoyed each other since, I need not tell you. But this, I do assure you, no other man has enjoyed me but Herbert, and as long as he is kind to me, no other shall. My history is ended. We thanked the charming girl for her confession. It was now getting daylight and almost time for us to separate. During Amy's recital we had partaken freely of spiced wine, and all of us felt almost as vigorous as ever. We decided we would not separate until we could enter the lists of love no more. Herbert brought a new auxiliary to our pleasures in the field, for going to a cupboard he took from it an india-rubber dildo which he strapped round Amy's waist. And placing me on my side on the couch, he made Amy insert the dildo into my vagina, while she put her finger on my clitoris and began to rub it, at the same time moving her buttocks as if she were a man. He then went behind me and entered me en coul. Amy acted her part splendidly. Herbert passed his hand over her bottom and inserted his finger in her sheath. Both Herbert and Amy moved together, and I had the delicious pleasure of enjoying a double embrace. Herbert's finger, too, was active, and we all discharged simultaneously. After we had recovered, we danced naked about the room. Herbert kissed our breasts, bottoms, and mounts. He placed his staff between our bubbies, he tickled our clitorises, and committed a thousand other follies. At last he lay down on the couch and pulled Amy on the top of him. She guided his instrument into her coral sheath and moved herself rapidly up and down, while I clapped her broad white bottom with my hand until they were cherry red, and while I was thus engaged Herbert's toe entered my slit, and in this manner we all again discharged. It would tire the reader to tell all the ways we adopted to arrive at the same result. Herbert embraced us en con, en coul, between the bubbies, between the buttocks, in fact in every possible mode, and we did not separate until we were thoroughly exhausted, and until the morning sun was several hours in the heavens. End of Volume 2, Chapter 2